Thank you very much for joining this session um, entitled I Compute, Therefore I Am, Ethical AI with and for the people. Um, I'm very humbled to give a very short introduction. My name is Elizabeth Ling. Um, I lead um, data science teams and product managers in Elsevier. I have been in digital product management for 20 years. And my passion is to build digital applications for the users so that we can all do what we want to do online uh, for the benefits of ourselves and, and generally are what we aim to do. So that's really my passion. I started to do that in 97 in France. Um, I will give you a very short introduction in three or four minutes, and then I will pass on to Raja Shatila, and Raja will give you, um, as an expert in the field of AI and ethics, a deep perspective on what he has collaborated with, um, and there is a lot to say. So. Then we will pass on to Albena. Albena will give us um, the latest perspective from the European Commission. So we know that the U European Commission has been at the forefront of also this topic. And I was um, a humble member of a high level expert group. So I have been witnessing this from, I would say, the side. And it's been a very interesting journey. So thank you, Albena. Following from that, we will have a live Q&A uh, where I will uh, ask the audience, please, to ask questions for Raja and Albena. I have a few for them to, you know, just surprise them, see if they can tell us a few more things. And then we will pass on to the second part of the session, which is a panel. And um, Schweitzer will introduce the panelists. There, there is an amazing panel. So I think the aim from all of us, because we have prepared the session very well, the aim is to have a lively, entertaining discussion but thought-provoking and with that i would like to say um enjoy breathe and relax we're all on zoom far too much at the moment so if you can enjoy these first two slides just as a little smile for me and then we will crack on with much more serious thinking so the first point i would like to make is the fact that there are probably as many ethics and AI frameworks as there are stars in the sky and that's great. I really believe that this gives me hope. Um, I have started to work on this journey more recently than many of the experts, but through my life as a product manager, I have always stumbled upon big choices in user interfaces, in optimization on algorithms. So the fact that there are so many frameworks is a good sign. Um, when I look at the sky, the sky, I also see hope. And I think a common, denominator in the whole group uh, on the session is hope that we're making progress and you will hear a lot of that but if you look at the sky you can also see that the stars are on their own so what we are here today to do is to join the dots um, and a lot has accelerated positively this year with the launch of the global partnership and 15 countries coming together before that many initiatives were already in place we had seen AI safety at the beginning. We had seen things from Canada, from uh, the IEEE. There are so many, I, I don't want to, to offend anyone, but we are starting to see things coalesce and that, that's also good. So we're here to continue to join the dots. And finally, uh, there's also you know, black matter. So there are gaps, there are holes. And the second theme of the session is to identify which gaps collectively we still have to fill. And certainly Raja and Albena have a few things to say on those gaps and their wishes about those. And before I pass on, I would like to say, uh, we often all think about the impact of AI applications on us as humans when we use them. And so I wanted to use this time to also put a little bit of light on the humans who help build those applications. So I took this picture this afternoon, completely randomly in London, and this is someone who is actually helping map. You see a little alley in London which, on which cars can't drive. So I was just 
very curious to see that, you know, just walking this afternoon just before speaking to all of you. So let's all remember that there's a lot of humans in the application, in building those applications, in using those applications. And I think as generally I was taught at eBay, you know, through Pierre Omidia thinking, people are basically good. So I think all of us basically want to do good things with AI, but it's a very hard problem. It's very complex. We can draw on the past. There are also new dimensions of automation, scale, black boxes. So we need a lot of us, a lot of efforts. And um, with this introduction, thank you very much for the attention in the coming, um, I would say, hour and a half. I hope you enjoy it. And now we'll hand over to Raja. And this is where the magic happened. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Perfect. Then I'll launch my presentation and I hope now it's full screen. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, uh, today to uh, attend this event. Um, uh, my name is Raja Shatila. I'm professor at uh, Sorbonne University in Paris and performing my research at the Institute of uh, Intelligent Systems and Robotics. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, European High-Level Expert Group on AI. I chair the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. And uh, I'm co-chair of the GPI, uh, that uh, Elzet mentioned a little uh, moment ago, uh, I'll speak about this later, uh, the working group on responsible AI. I'm going to speak about ethics and AI ethics in general, but uh, the question actually is that AI uh, is today in so many applications, in so many domains, in so many sectors, and this is great because it has uh, a lot of impact on uh, businesses, on uh, daily life, uh, on uh, the public sector, and it's proving, improving our lives. However, sometimes we see applications which uh, are more or less disturbing uh, or raise some issues. So I'm not uh, going to speak, of course, about uh, all the nice applications. I'm going to focus when we speak about ethics about the issues, the tensions, the problems that may arise. So here are a few examples um, of the use of AI-based systems that you see in the press or that uh, you see in practice. Uh, and and uh, uh, from, uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, device that you have at home to uh, order pizza, but which is listening to you at all times. Uh, to the use of AI in the judiciary system or in defense. Uh, therefore, uh, there are some issues to raise. Now, let me start with what AI is actually, so that we are all on the same ground and uh, understanding what we are speaking about. Uh, this uh, picture shows uh, what the definition of AI as proposed by the high level expert group. So you see it's a broad area. It includes uh, reasoning, search, planning, etc. It includes robotics in part, not the mechanical one. It includes machine learning. Today, when we speak about AI, we mostly speak about machine learning because this is the domain that has uh, presented a lot of progress uh, recently. And uh, machine learning uh, the, uh, is actually uh, using supervised learning unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. Basically, these systems do statistical data processing and classification. And basically, most of them use artificial neural nets as classifiers, use probability distributions to build correlations, uh, and use optimization algorithms. To be more specific, uh, this slide presents a very, very simple neural net. It has an input layer on the left, an output layer on the right, and in the middle, it's called a hidden layer because it's in between. And uh, the whole issue about uh, 
uh, learning here is to train the system, to train this neural network. Each neuron is a small computing uh, uh, device, a very simple computing device, but the network has a lot of capacity and the capacity to learn. To learn what? Well, by processing a lot of data as input and running an optimization algorithm, which is in this case of supervised learning is called back propagations. You can, the system is actually computing those synaptic weights, Ws, so that they adjust to produce the right, the expected value. For example, here you want to identify from a lot of data, cats and dogs, but it could be anything else. And it could be many classes as well. So the whole process is really a process of computation to train the network. And then when you present a new input, it will be able, if it was trained properly and designed properly, to identify it. Let me go to a concrete example. Here, you have a very simple neural net. It also has three uh, layers that ha has been built. It's a conver conversational neural net to uh, identify if in pictures there are faces. It's not about face, facial recognition, but recognizing that there are faces. And what I want to show here is what are the parameters that influence this training process. Now, of course, the data on the left here is uh, the uh, uh, major influencer because the system is going to learn on the basis of this data. And if this data presents a, uh, if this present, uh, data uh, uh, presents some bias, for example, if you have only white faces, it will learn more to recognize white faces and not, for example, uh, faces of people of color. Uh, and second is the labels. The data doesn't come by itself. It's labeled. It's labeled mostly by humans, actually, uh, putting labels on what the data is. So this also presents some bias because according to the labels, the captions of the images, the result will be different. There is also from the side of the programmer, the choice of features that are going to be detected in the neural net images. Uh, those choice of features will, which will lead to the result. And for example, here, the features are simply alignments of uh, pixels. For example, if you have alignment, uh, 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 alignment of two sets, two small sets of picture of pixels horizontally, these are labeled eyes. And if you have another alignment, which is be below them, uh, this is called mouth. And if you have both at the same time, this is called face. So you see the face is reduced to something very, very simple, which is this alignment of pixel. And this is a choice of the programmer. The class semantics that I just mentioned, face, eyes, mouth, could be something else, but this is the choice. Also, of course, the architecture, and the architecture is designed by the programmer as well, and the parameters, and the whole optimization process that I mentioned earlier. All this doesn't come from, uh, if I may say, the sky. It might come from the cloud because you, you reuse some uh, 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 um, systems that are already existing, but it comes from a choice by the human designer. And this is important. Now, something else uh, I want to mention is about reinforcement learning. Uh, reinforcement learning is a process to reinforce, to select some actions based on a state in which the robot operates and on a reward that it receives when it accomplishes this action. The reward is just a number, a number, positive, negative, a large, small, but it's a number that would be attached to the result of the action. If the action goes in the right direction, and right direction is something that is expressed by the objective function that is programmed. And the objective function is tailored to the problem. And Basically, we are optimizing a function, and this is the function that is, don't look at the details, but it's a, it's a math function which express this uh, global reward that the system is maximizing. Now, here are examples uh, about deep learning limitations, and this is extracted from a paper published uh, last year, actually, where you see that the system recognizes with some 
probability, some, some uh, uh, accuracy actually, uh, what is in the image. So for example, this is a school bus with a very, very high probability uh, or accuracy, one. But you put it in a different position, it becomes a punching bag or a snowplow and the motor scooter becomes a parachute. Well, this, I'm not going into the details of why this happens, but this tells us that the AI system does not understand what it's seeing. It doesn't understand what it's doing. It's just processing images based on it, the learning process. Now, <clears throat> as a conclusion to this part, uh, I'm insisting on the fact that machine decisions are on the computational level. They don't understand semantics. Semantics are understood by humans and input in the system as a human understand them. And the system will work on this basis and therefore will act within a bounded set of decisions which have been predefined directly or indirectly through learning. Uh, the uh, unexpected consequences may happen because the uh, objective function that I've shown earlier does not really correspond exactly to the aim, to the um, uh, purpose of the programmer or the designer. And this happens very frequently as well. Now, because of all these limitations and uh, some uh, uh, scandals, for example, the uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal, a, a lot of people uh, from the domain and from outside the domain uh, uh, decided to look into the ethics of using AI systems. And there has been, Elizabeth mentioned, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, initiatives. I'm going to focus on the IEEE Global Initiative on the uh, European Commission's high-level expert group and the Global Partnership on AI, which is the newest one, if I may say. Uh, so the, uh, this initiative is interesting because it's bottom-up. A lot of initiatives are bottom-up, but this has been started in 2016, and the IEEE is a, a large uh, international organization, uh, a scientific uh, uh, association in the area of uh, computer science, engineering, uh, technology, electrical, electronics, engineering. And the idea here is really that from those who design those systems, the initiative is to try to uh, frame uh, some ethical approaches. And uh, I'm going to uh, move forward because we don't have time, but uh, you can look on the website and, and see that there is a, a, a document which uh, explains how to, uh, based on, on pillars, uh, move to uh, recommendations after recognizing some issues related to the use of AI-based systems in several areas. But with this, there are standards, industrial standards, uh, ethical standards actually, that can be used to develop AI-based systems which comply with some ethical uh, processes. Uh, there is also a certification pro program, and this is really important. We can get back to that in the discussion. The uh, GPI, uh, Global Partnership on AI, has started actually in June. And this is based on 15 countries plus the OECD uh, that have uh, shared this uh, initiative. And uh, uh, now four working groups are actually operating. One of those working groups that I'm co-chairing with uh, Joshua Bengio is called the Responsible AI Working Group. And this is really focusing on those issues related to uh, what we are talking about today, uh, responsible AI uh, working group. Uh, there are also other groups, one on data governance, on the future of work, on commercialization, plus one, which is close to the uh, responsible AI working group on the pandemic, because of course, we have to also address this issue. Uh, and uh, to uh, conclude, there is the high-level expert group with the uh, AI, with the European Commission, and uh, this group has been organized into 18 and come up with recommendations, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. And, and we have uh, Elizabeth and Francesca, for example, here, members of this group. What is important is uh, uh, what the main output here is that there are requirements for trustworthy AI that have been identified, put forward by this uh, committee, seven requirements. And these requirements are addressed to the designers, to the deployers, to the users as well of AI-based systems. And uh, they enumerate 
what are the requirements so that we can use AI technologies uh, with trust in a trustworthy manner. Human agency and oversight means that, of course, uh, the, uh, there is always uh, an oversight of the humans in the operation, in the design. The, the system doesn't work by itself, doesn't learn by itself and does what it wants. This shouldn't be acceptable. Uh, we have to have this oversight. Technical robustness and safety is key, of course. We do not want to deploy systems that are not safe, not reliable, that we want to deploy systems that are dependable and reproducible. Privacy and data governance, this is really key, of course, because uh, access to data and, and uh, ownership of data is important and you have to uh, put data governance processes uh, in, in play. Transparency, traceability, explainability, these are open issues. We don't know today how to make uh, AI-based system explainable, but this is a requirement, which means we should work towards this objective as much as we can. Diversity and non-discrimination, of course, fairness is key to uh, have, be inclusive and, and develop systems that actually take into account the diversity of society, uh, societal and, and environmental well-being. Uh, and, and this, of course, social impact, you know that it's very easy to uh, propagate fake news, etc. So uh, there is a, a, an important societal impact and uh, society and democracy are impacted, but also there is the environment which is impacted. And finally, accountability. Whose accountability is it? It's the accountability of human beings, not of the systems who develop, deploy the systems. And uh, therefore we need to have this accountability in place. And this is also related to governance processes. I think now I will leave the ground uh, uh, and uh, I, I believe uh, the second uh, is the presentation of the European uh, Commission point of view. So this is uh, a good baton passing. Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Raja. You actually told a lot of uh, many of the things that I wanted to mention, and it was a very good uh, introduction to, to what I want to share with you. Uh, going back to the limitations, sorry to the limitations of AI and what AI actually means for our everyday life. I want to like, I would like to compare it to electricity, the same way electricity changed our life. Now AI is increasingly changing our life and similar to electricity, we are becoming increasingly dependent on it. But unlike electricity, AI is constantly changing the way we behave and the way we interact. And this can sometimes uh, cause a lot of concerns. And while we are still at the point where uh, AI has a limitation and there is still way to go until it becomes truly intelligent, we don't want to be uh, like in the Jurassic Park uh, movie scenario where the scientists resurrected the dinosaurs from the dead and then they realized that this may have not been a good idea. We want to act now and we want to make sure that now we can define the future that uh, our children want to live in, a future where they can determine their own life uh, and their own well-being, the future where they can decide what they want to be. And this decision is not uh, based on a machine uh, AI-based algorithm, a future where they can distinguish between the false news and the reality, uh, where they can uh, realize what is deep fake and what is not, a future where an algorithm won't decide where, whether they are obedient citizen and they follow all the rules, or um, they have to, to be deprived from their freedom because of an algorithmic decision-making. A future where 
the fate of which university you are going to go won't be decided by an algorithm, but it will be decide, uh, decided based on an objective criteria. How to do it? The same way we did uh, this for all other technologies that we have been regulating and all other scientific uh, advancements that we have been witnessing uh, so far by embedding ethics by design from the very moment, uh, from the very start of the research development process. The last two years have been very busy from a policy uh, perspective. Um, this is a brief overview of some of the major EU policy initiatives in the field of AI and ethics. Uh, on the 10th of April 2018, uh, the Digital Day Declaration was signed by member states agreeing to cooperate in the um, area of AI. And in the same year, we know that uh, the General Data Protection Regulation entered into force a bit later on 25 of May, uh, thus making Europe one of the flagship, uh, one of the golden start, uh, golden. Um, label uh, area and regions where privacy is uh, truly protected. Now we want to be the global leader in the area of AI and ethics. Uh, by uh, adopting the European AI strategy and by um, adopting the easy communication on trust and human-centric based AI, the European Commission clearly declared uh, the aim to build an ecosystem of trust. We believe that the deployment and the uptake of AI is only dependent on the, the trust of the people in, in the system. If they don't trust the system, then um, they, don't, they won't use it. Um, and this is, this is uh, uh, and if they, don't, if they don't use it, it will be very uh, difficult to compete with the global uh, powers in the world. The creation of the EC high-level group on uh, artificial intelligence aimed to bring the opinion of academics, ethicists, and businesses, to bring them to, to one table uh, so that uh, everybody can share their opinion on how ethics uh, should be embedded in, in AI-based technology, and if this is possible at all. Uh, my fellow uh, panelists here know that there were a lot of heated debates between businesses, between entities, and uh, between, me, uh, between um, academia on how we should implement ethics and what should be the main uh, guiding principles. But... Um, the principles already presented by, by Raja um, found the support of the overwhelming majority of people and also they reflect the uh, Charter of Fundam Fundamental Rights and the way we, we develop and, and implement new technologies. The white paper on AI is uh, the latest biggest document published by the European Commission aimed to see on how we can build trust, ecosystem of trust, while building also ecosystem of excellence. How to encourage the development of AI while at the same time preserving our human rights. And the approach that is is uh, very much a bottom-up approach, similar to, to all other international organizations what we consider extremely important is to hear what people think. Apart from the high-level ethics group on AI consisting of uh, 52 experts, uh, we, um, we, um, we launch a, a huge public consultation related to the question, shall we regulate AI? How shall we regulate AI? What kind of measures you consider most important when we um, talk about deployment of AI system in the everyday life. And the answers to the, of the public consultation show that the main concerns uh, of the European citizen business and uh, academia and non-government relates to possible breaches of fundamental rights caused by uh, AI possible discrimination, lack of safety, 
lack of explainability, lack of accuracy, and lack of accountability uh, linked to the lack of compensation in costs of in cases of harm. How to go from a pol policy level, from uh, principles into practice? How to enable researchers, scientists, and developers to actually embed the principles that the high-level group recommended into a workable uh, technical solution? Um, we have deployed different and we have made different steps in, in this direction. One of the steps is uh, we increase the funding for dedicated projects that aim to analyze and scan the technical horizon and to identify the social, economic and human rights impact of different technologies on the society, proposing ethical frameworks and workable operational um, guidelines on embedding the, trust, the recommendation of the high level group of trustworthy AI into the everyday research process. Uh, two of the projects that you see on the screen are Project Siena, Stakeholders Inform Ethics for New Technology, High Social, Economic and Human Rights Impact, and the Project Sherpa that looks at the ethical dimension on a smart information system. These uh, two projects uh, combine the expertise of more than 22 partners from member states, but also from um, uh, strategic partners like Brazil, South Africa, and China. Uh, they work within 20, 42 months, trying not only to gather the academic knowledge and, and, and the wisdom of um, the academic society, but also feel the pulse of uh, the community by doing a lot of citizen panels, by implementing um, surveys. Uh, the last surveys, uh, one of the survey that Siena did was 11,000 uh, people were surveyed on their uptake and attitude towards robotics and artificial intelligence technologies. Um, they are conducting a lot of stakeholders analysis and the overall um, delivery deliverable that these two projects will present to the commission are their advice on oper operationalizing and implementing ethics by design in the very uh, beginning of the research development of, of new technologies. And I'm sure that Bernd in the second part of the session will uh, the coordinator of Sherpa will also tell us more about it. Another way of ensuring ethics by design uh, in EU funded projects, a commitment that the European Commission made in the coordinated action plan on AI is to include the technical robustness requirements in the calls for proposals of Horizon 2020. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, heard it yet, Horizon 2020 is the biggest uh, research and innovation program of the European Union. Uh, the next uh, framework program, Horizon Europe, which starts from uh, next year, proposed increased funding for AI that will go up to 100 billion. What we are doing in terms of technical robustness, we include the technical robustness in the call for proposals, asking the received proposals to explain and ensure the safety, reproducibility, usability, reliability, and usefulness of the presented technologies to explain how they will deal with possible inaccuracies and possible failures or errors, and what is the reasoning behind the decision-making that uh, their proposed solution may take place. What you see on the screen is a call from AI Health Imaging, but such kind of um, a text will be increasingly common in, in the next framework program, and they ensure the safety, uh, but also the trustworthiness of, of the EU-funded uh, AI-based solutions. And the next um, example on how we embed ethics by design for AI-based uh, funded solution is the ethics review process in Horizon 2020 funded projects, all proposals that are suggested for uh, European funding 
undergo and pass the scientific evaluation. So they're um, evaluated as excellent in terms of science. They go through an ethics review process. And during this ethics review process and independent ethics reviewers decide if the methodology that was proposed is ethically sound. Based on what they see in the proposal, the experts may either clear the proposal, meaning that ethics uh, has become an inter integral part of the proposed uh, scientific uh, proposal, or they can recommend uh, measures for improvement, which become contractual obligations and uh, thus obligatory for the research consortium that is funded under Horizon 2020, or they can refuse the proposal based on ethics grounds. The, I'm very happy to say that increasingly the independent ethics experts are using the recommendations from the high level group um, on AI and require the uh, applicants developing especially technologies, uh, very high risk technologies uh, like um, technologies that will be deplo deployed in the healthcare or technologies that are deployed in the security and police uh, area to comply with the recommendations uh, developed and the principles developed by the high level group and explain how these principles will be implemented in, in practice. Thank you very much. Happy to answer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Raja. Thank you very much, Albena. So please, um, we have uh, already questions from the audience. If you want to continue to submit them, um, do, do if you want and feel comfortable with that, uh, add your name and your uh, affiliation. Uh, if you want to remain anonymous, obviously that's fine as well. So um, we have, uh, to get us started, a um, question actually for Albena. Albena. So Albena, um, so um, we we see. I think the, the, if I get the gist of the question, it's very good to see that there are now um, ethics reviews, right? I think it's a very nice development. We see that in a lot of country, this triage is actually done by specialized institutions. So, um, do you foresee? And I will broaden the question um, because we could say that. In private companies as well, you know, these types of research efforts are happening. Or it, when, uh, let's say, um, we build applications, they have sometimes an impact on users. So, who has the mandate to actually review and decide what is ethical from your point of view? And how are you, from the European Commission perspective, gathering the civil society, the ethicists, the experts, so that the, the panel? who has the mandate is a broad and diverse panel? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's a challenge. I have to admit at uh, national level and at regional level, currently we have a network of ethics committees, uh, which are very well established in the field of, in, in the medical field. Uh, we have been witnessing development, steady development of medical ethics for the last 50 years. Uh, this is unfortunately not uh, the case with, with the ethics of AI. Uh, and this is quite a new field uh, that will require uh, a different expertise. So uh, at, 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 at national level, at the regional level, at the level of institutional ethics committees, uh, it will be uh, good to see the involvement of uh, more data scientists, data ethicists, more uh, depending on the profile of the ethics committees, of course, uh, we need specialized AI developers. And the way that this, uh, the composition of the ethics committee is decided is very much dependent on the national legislation uh, of the country and the uh, practices in some countries, the, there is specific law that actually mandates the involvement of also um, civil society, of citizens uh, in the ethics committee. In some countries, such legislation is missing and it's more reliant on the good practices. Uh, what we are trying to do is to create a network of, of these committees. We support uh, already such projects which 
aim to network, to exchange best practices and to harmonize the approaches. But uh, it has taken almost 50 years for the medical ethics and I hope it will take uh, much less for AI. Thank you, that's very interesting. And you mentioned network and connecting the people. And, and also, I think you, you allude to the fact that it's all relative to the use case and the level of risk, because it's a horizontal capability. But I think in the group, certainly we debated a lot with Raja and Francesca that it had to be about the use case and the application. So Raja, this leads me to another question. Um, what would you see as a gap in terms of perhaps um, giving hope to the citizens of the benefits because i think so far we have talked about heavy topics you know how to keep it safe etc but how do we actually uh, give trust through benefits and through positive applications how do you see that happening and uh, what's going on from that perspective yes this is a really important question i mean when we speak about trustworthy ai it means people have to trust the systems and um, Trust comes with this compliance with the requirements that we have mentioned and through the mechanisms that were also mentioned by Albena. Uh, so uh, two things maybe. One is education, dissemination, explanation to people that AI achieves uh, very uh, uh, high quality services and improves people's life. Uh, but also the, at the same time, reassuring citizens that this doesn't is not the law of the jungle. It comes within a framework, a governance framework. And this governance framework, I think, is important to, of course, define. Uh, Albena mentioned about this. And, and uh, also popularize, explain that it exists, that decision makers are doing something about it so that people can trust the systems. Thank you, thank you. That's that's very good. Um, and certainly, from my experience as a product manager, um, the users, you know, where you see big data sets being built of behavioral data, is that when there's a clear benefit to the user and the quality of the design, the quality of the experience. So unfortunately, you could say some of the large companies are not in Europe at the moment. It's perhaps because we need better European champions of digital applications. And uh, I love the fact that I think the European Commission is also connecting on uh, you know, venture capital and how do we actually innovate and build, um, I would say, private companies and jobs in EU to build those applications you know, which are positive. So I'm, I'm very keen about that. Um, perhaps, and I think the, we, we're, we're slightly short of time, so perhaps I will just uh, ask um, uh, Albena one more question and then Raja one more question, which um, Albena, from your perspective and the European Commission, do you also try to, through the Global Alliance, align to the Sustainable Development Goals? I mean, how do you see you know, the aims of Europe and the aim globally that we all have? Because we're talking about joining the dots. So I would be curious of how you describe that connection. I, I, I think we, we certainly, certainly uh, we as, ascribe to the um, SDGs. And what I want to say is that we have to see an AI as a tool, a tool that will help us uh, achieve uh, the the development goals that we have uh, that we have set and if we look at the the different applications of AI and we also if we look at the uh, principles of the high level group we will see that AI can really help and uh, increase I mean by ethics by design decrease the inequalities increase the the uh, gender equalities. Uh, can help us achieve our green goals and achieve the, the Green Deal objectives. So AI should be seen as a tool and we have to use it as such. AI should not be the, the technology that shapes and our way of how we should live. It should be the other way around. The AI is, is, is the way that will help us, a, a very useful tool that will help us achieve a more equality, uh, less poverty, and uh, more sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Albena. Now, Raja, I give you the challenge of answering this in five words. <laughs> what's, what's still missing? What's the gap from your point of view? Where, where should we progress? <laughs> five words. Uh, 
I think we have to include uh, people, I mean, specialists, of course, of AI, but also philosophers, sociologists, uh, to, uh, and of course, decision makers to frame the whole issues, to understand the whole issues. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you both of you. Thank you for your uh, preparation. And I will hand over now to uh, Spitzer to uh, moderate the panel. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. That was uh, that was wonderful. And um, thank you, Chetil um, and Alberna, for a great overview of, of what's been happening. Um, my name is Svetse Roffel. I'm um, the Answer Publisher for AI, uh, which means if you've paid attention and looked at uh, Raja's overview of AI, you have the, the symbolic part um, and the, the more machine learning part. So I publish artificial intelligence, neural networks, robotics, pattern recognition, and the like. I would like to um, introduce our panelists where we want to go a little bit beyond all these principles. I mean, we've seen various principles of AI from, I would say, 2016 up till now uh, being promulgated, and most of them have the same uh, uh, general set of principles. How do we maximize the benefits and minimize the, um, the bad things of, of new technology? Uh, we'll get more onto that, but I'd first like to uh, introduce in alphabetical for order um, a great lineup of panelists we have for you. Uh, we will go by them with a couple of questions. Um, and please also feel free to ask your own questions later on if we have time for a third round. Um, and I will start with the introductions. So um, our first panelist is Emma uh, boger ossulet She's a senior track associate uh, at the Digital Society School at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Um, the interesting thing is that she, uh, to follow on a little bit on, on, on uh, Alberna's last comment, is she actually leads projects that apply AI for positive social impacts. Um, and what she tries to do is there find out how you can uh, implement the, the SDGs, uh, so the UN uh, Sustainable Development School. Um, her prior research was at uh, CWI, which is a well-known Dutch uh, um, uh, thought leadership center on uh, math. Um, our next uh, uh, panelist is Rudy van Belkom. He is actually a futurist. Um, working at, again, the Dutch Center of Technology Trends. Uh, he has written a book uh, on uh, the design process, um, where, like we also heard before, AI is actually a, a design choice. The book is called AI No Longer Has a, a Plug. And to make that more actionable, he also uh, co-designed an ethical design uh, game uh, that developers can use uh, in their agile development process, together with the uh, Dutch Standards Commission on AI of the NEN. Uh, and the uh, AI lecturate of the uh, Applied Science University. We have Francesca Rossi, who is very well known in the field. Um, she's on the advisory board of the Future of Life Institute. Uh, she is on the IEEE Global Initiative. She's a member of the board of directors of the Global Partnership of AI. Um, she represents IBM. She was on the high level expert group. Uh, she has been in AI far longer than I have. Um, and then we have Bernd Stahl, who leads uh, a major center on the uh, social responsibility of ICT um, and has been doing uh, research in the applications uh, of, of ICT research for more than 25 years and who is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Responsible Research. So that should give you an idea of what a cool lineup we have to follow up our previous cool lineup. And I would like to uh, then move on to the first question, actually to Francesca Rossi. Um, we have just uh, spoken uh, from various initiatives from our speakers. How, in moving from actual policies, right, to actual practice, how do you feel the roles of, of multi-stakeholder initiatives in AI ethics work? Um, and you're involved in one of them, Partnership of AI. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Thanks, Faisa. Thanks, everybody. I mean, it's very nice to be here in this panel. Uh, so, as uh, somebody working on AI ethics within a corporation, like it's my case that I work at IBM Research, uh, the work is mostly follows these two uh, complementary but also very 
coordinated uh, line of work. One is internal, you know, how to operationalize high level principle internally to the company. And of course, it depends on how the company is structured, what the company is already doing with AI and all the other things, you know. And, uh, and then the second line of work, so, and in that case, you need to put in place many, many things, not just uh, say, these are the principle and then uh, you tell the developers to follow the principle. That's not that easy. So you need to put in place educational material, training, uh, toolkits, um, uh, co community discussions, uh, the internal AI ethics board, uh, enforcing capabilities and so on. So a lot of internal governance. And then there are these uh, external activities because of course uh, we need to uh, work with other companies other stakeholders, other experts of other disciplines, as Raja mentioned, uh, to understand together what are the best practices mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, uh, defining um, what, what it means for AI to be beneficial for all. And one of them uh, in this initiative, besides, as you said, you know, the IEEE initiative, um, the high level as per group, of course, is another one, uh, the, glob the new global partnership on AI. We also do work with the UN, uh, with the AI for Good initiative of ITU, also with the World Economic Forum, but one of them that I think is one of the first one that was put together already in 2016 is the Partnership on AI. And the Partnership on AI was founded by six companies. So I would say the main IT companies in the world, so IBM, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. And these six companies got together not just to discuss among themselves what are the best practices, but to put in place a place where uh, put in place a, an environment, a collaborative environment where multiple stakeholders could get together and discuss uh, in a very constructive and collaborative way about the main issues around AI ethics, whether it's related to fairness or to transparency or the impact on society and so on. And now the this uh, partnership on AI that started with six companies as a, about 100 partners of which about 20 are companies and everybody else is a non-for-profit entity and uh, they, they represent uh, many other stakeholders so university uh, research centers uh, UN agencies uh, advocacy groups uh, uh, consumer rights association human rights association and so on and all together we define projects around the specific issues for example, there is a project called About ML, about uh, transparency on uh, how to build transparency uh, while developing a, an AI solution. Another one is the use on, on the, the use of AI in uh, in the U.S. judicial system, and in particular in predicting uh, recidivism. Another project is about media integrity. Another one is about uh, uh, use cases and lessons learned about explainability. So different projects, in each project, some partners of these 100 participate. And usually the Partnership and AI office tries to get this partnership into each project balance between profit and non-profit. Um, and the, the, the goal, again, is to define and disseminate these best practices as uh, the as uh, put together and agreed by some of the main uh, stakeholders and players in the in the field of AI. And, uh, and it's uh, important to know that uh, all these uh, reports, use cases, uh, documents that come out of the partnership on AI, most of the time, uh, there are very few exceptions, but most of the time are not signed by the specific people or partners that participated in the project, but are signed by the partnership on AI. To say that that the intent is to build a community, a trusted community, uh, where the society, the regulators, or whoever can go and uh, read what the AI community uh, uh, has to say about a specific topic. So that I find to ask your question. So what you're basically saying is these, these multi-stakeholder things and all these projects actually enable learning by doing, right? Well, uh, you have, you have all, stakeholders who define projects and then they, yes. they do them and then they come with recommendations. 
Exactly. And each partner, I get the impression that each partner over time has, in this project has learned a lot from the other partners by being together. But I also noticed that uh, um, uh, what we say at the partnership on AI, we use this uh, term uh, productive disagreement. Because of course the partners do not agree with each other when they get together for a project, but we manage in some way to make this disagreement productive, constructive active and uh, to be able to really discuss together. So there are some uh, uh, combination of partners that get together at the partnership on AI that that would be, you know, that at the first sight, that would be strange to see these people or these entities together uh, uh, in the same in the same room or at the same table. But that is uh, the power of this uh, environment, which is very collaborative and just people that want to learn to do what is best for uh, the impact of AI. So, so that sounds very interesting, and I'm I'm definitely coming back to you on on to ask you what's what you have learned so far and what concrete actions you would take. Um, I would I would now like to after this introduction move to our next panelist, uh, Rudy van Belkom, as as our futurist. Is you've written a book that covers many of these uh, uh, um, projects and you've looked at many of these principled approaches, if you will. Um, and a lot of them are very similar. Uh, um, you know, most of them want to do good and not bad. Uh, it's not that simple. Um, but could you give us a little bit of a deeper flavor of how you feel that they are similar or different uh, that, that came out of the uh, over the last couple of years? Well, to start with, uh, I think there are a lot of them. So like in 2019, researchers of ETH Zurich, it's a public research university, they analyzed no fewer than 84 ethical guidelines that were published worldwide in recent years. So from the private sector to civil society and, and also governments, obviously. Um, and when you look at the, the differences, but also the similarities, you can see there, there is a clear convergence surrounding principles. I mean, for example, transparency, fairness, reliability, responsibility, and privacy, they are mentioned in more than half of all those resources, of all those sources. Um, but however, there are significant, significant differences in the way uh, those ethical principles are interpreted. So, for example, according to some guidelines, AI is meant to make the decision-making process explainable. So, it has to give an explanation. While other guidelines, they argue that it is necessary for the decisions of AI to be completely traceable as well. So, when you put it on paper, you say, okay, explainable, traceable, potato, potato, but it's in practice, there's a big difference between being just explainable, but also being uh, traceable as well. So I think it's important to integrate the various guidelines to reach a more worldwide consensus about adequate implementation strategies. And obviously there are different approaches. Also the uh, OECD, they're trying to make a more worldwide approach and, and look at different stakeholders. And it's a good effort, obviously, but still, the there, like I said, there are a lot of those different yeah. principles, but the distribution is limited. So most ethical guidelines, they come from the US, they have 21 guidelines from those 84, Europe 19 and Japan four. Yeah. And the highest guideline density is found in the United Kingdom where there are 13 ethical guidelines. So oh, that's nice. Our, Above all, it are more the richer countries that dominate the worldwide discussion about AI. And although some developing countries contributed, they didn't write their own. And I think that's also really important because obviously different values are also cultural. So we yeah. need different perspectives. Thank you. I think that's that's really interesting. And I, I definitely want to come back on that, on, on, on the value-based design process, even in, in how you regulate ethics. Um, I'd, I'd now also like to move to um, one of our next panelists, uh, Bernd Stahl. Is Bernd, you have been researching technology and policy for more than 25 years. Um, and you even edit a journal on there. And my question to you is, is this really something different? I mean, what makes AI different than, say, the cookie controversy? Uh, when the web came out, uh, or um, any other new technology where we might scratch our head and say, hmm, we don't know how this is going to pan out. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that and, and the type of work you're doing around that? 
Yeah, um, to start out with, I think there is a lot of um, repetition. So you can observe a lot of the same issues and questions that were discussed in other contexts, uh, now discussed in the context of AI. Um, questions of privacy, intellectual property, access, these are absolutely not new in any way. Um, I think if you want to try to understand whether there is anything new and what that is, uh, it, it's useful to start by understanding how these technologies play out in practice and, and in social reality. Um, and I would draw on the on the Sherpa project that Albena um, referred to earlier. So in that project, we've actually started out by trying to understand how do these things happen in reality. So we did a bunch of 10 case studies where we looked at organizations using different types of what we call smart information systems or so AI big data combinations. Uh, we developed a set of uh, scenarios. So we worked with stakeholders to think about what are near term future um, likely developments. Uh, and we also did, of course, uh, all the other usual stuff. So we looked at the literature on human rights, on ethics. Um, and I think that there are, uh, the ethical issues can be carved up to some degree by the concept of AI you use. So going back to what Raja started with earlier, uh, I think in the narrow sense, uh, we're looking at machine learning. And machine learning has certain uh, characteristics, and they give rise to certain types of ethical issues. So machine learning uh, is difficult to understand, it's difficult to trace, explain. Um, and that leads to questions around uh, reliability, transparency, biases. Um, so these are very narrow level um, issues arising specifically in machine learning. But if you look at the overall AI discourse, I think it's much broader than that. Um, so a lot of the issues arise not out of the specific characteristics of machine learning, but out of the characteristics of larger socio-technical systems, which have some sort of AI embedded in them. Um, and you might call those converging systems or we call them smart information systems. Uh, those are the things that then lead to broader social impacts that people are worried about. Things around um, unemployment, uh, economic power, and all the big six that uh, Francesca referred to are of course also extremely rich and extremely powerful economically and politically. Um, and that has something to do with AI, but it's not a direct consequence of the uh, characteristics of machine learning. And then finally, um, there is, uh, I think that, that was what Raja referred to in terms of reasoning, there's this idea of artificial general intelligence. So the idea that um, technologies can at some point become more human-like, which at the moment they're not, uh, but they may be. And we, uh, there's an interesting question of what are the ethical issues uh, that would arise then? So these are questions around super intelligence, now will be, humans become uh, outdated? So, so I think you have a, long, a broad range of things that people talk about when they so, say ethics of AI. And it depends on what concept of ethics uh, you use, what concept of AI you use. And it also depends on sort of the time, temporal horizon. Some of these things I think we can address. Uh, some of them are really big political processes. Now these have to do with social justice. How do we deal with the unemployment? And then some of them are possibly completely uh, impossible to address. So uh, do, will we ever understand human nature? Do we know what the meaning of, of knowledge is? What, well, possibly not. But those are still very interesting questions that are being discussed in the context of ethics of AI. Yeah. So I, I, I like it in, in the, the sense where you say that, that explaining machine learning is difficult, for example. And um, um, to, to kind of jump off on that uh, 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 notion is um, there was an interesting paper in the AI journal actually written by, by a, a sociologist, uh, by people from, from uh, the humanities which said that it's actually much more of a explainability is a social thing, not a technical thing. Um, and it's almost like trying to explain that your car is safe by first trying to explain how thermodynamics works in an internal combustion engine. Um, um, so I, have, I sometimes have a feeling that the discussions can be very technical when people just want to know it's actually well designed and, and, and who has power and control, which you say is a, is a very different discourse. Um, yeah. With social acceptance, obviously, that, that is also something where people need to get used to. And these things are often lumped in, in, in ELSA, uh, ethics, legal and social acceptance. Um, I like the fact that, that a lot of people are, are literally experimenting with that. And with that, I'd like to pivot to Emma. Um, Emma, you have been working on the practicalities of social acceptance um, um, for quite some time. As in, you run lots of different projects for lots of different stakeholders essentially around the um, uh, AI design process, and then with a specific uh, object to see if, if they can help uh, with the SDGs. Could you tell us a little bit how that works in practice? I mean, how do you translate these principles from principles on paper uh, to action? Thank you for the question. 
Um, it is true that we are working on a number of projects to, to translate not only the SDGs in practice, but also um, ethics, ethics goals and guidelines. But I'm gonna address uh, your question by, uh, by going back a little bit in time and some work that I, I did uh, back when I was at CWI. So when I first approached uh, the issue of uh, AI acceptance, it was from a particular niche. Uh, it was uh, using AI to monitor ecosystems. So basically to detect and count animals from different species and see where and when some populations may be threatened or may be declining. And it was really interesting because um, we were working with biologists and their scientists and they need reliable conclusions. It's about truth. They had very high requirements. And it also impacts uh, society and sustainability because the biologists' conclusions are meant to inform policymakers about the measures we should take to protect those ecosystems. So the, um, the issue of trust and acceptance was absolutely crucial. Um, so the AI results may be hard to accept sometimes, for instance, because they would ask us to drastically change our human activities to protect the uh, ecosystem and to build true sustainability. And when it's hard to accept the changes that we might need to, to make, then the uncertainty of the AI results might, might face intense scrutiny. Um, so actually being transparent about uncertainty is, is absolutely essential. And um, the biologists we worked with, they knew that AI could backfire against them and jeopardize all their scientific work. So um, AI can damage the reputation of the people who work for sustainability. And accepting AI in some cases can, can work against sustainability. Um, and there's- What I like about your example a lot is that you actually inadvertently introduce the concept of context, right? Uh, you work with biologists. Biologists have a worldview on how you should properly count animals. Um, and AI is a tool where you can actually do that with, right? Provided you deploy the tool sensibly and not unsensibly, which I think is, is one of the design values that, that most AI researchers would properly hit, is yeah. use the right tool for the right uh, uh, problem. Um, and and that with that, I'd like to go back to Bernd. Is is a lot of these ethics discussions, like I said before, are also framed as as Elsa ethics, legal, societal acceptance, and that means regulation, right? So uh, we hear a lot, uh, especially from the uh, uh, from the European side, uh, that they want to uh, you know push on human AI. Um, and kind of you know we have lots of huge tech companies in China and in in the US. Uh, and, and the human AI is supposed to be like the, the European thing. And the question is, with social acceptance, a lot of these can be universal, right? We have universal human rights, but a lot of them are, 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 are local and cultural. Um, and this is the European Science Forum. We are have heard from the European uh, Commission. Do you think we need specific regulation for AI, or do you think AI should be regulated in the domain where they are? So like if you use... AI for medical ethics, that should be covered by medical ethics. If you use it in the financial services industry, you, you know where I'm getting at, right? I hope at least, <laughs> I hope yeah. I frame my question uh, uh, in a way you can understand what I mean. Is, yeah. is AI something you would want to regulate or do you think, no, we have to educate the regulators who already regulate the world they, they inhibit? Well, I, I guess these two things uh, or these two alternatives don't exclude each other, right? Um, before I answer the uh, uh, terminology um, point, I think you, you refer to ethical, legal, social issues, the ELSA, LC. Um, and I think in, in my worldview, that's sort of a reactive approach. Something's gone wrong and we try to uh, rectify it. And I think uh, where we're now moving to is a more proactive approach, which uh, sometimes called responsible innovation or some such, where the idea is that you think about issues before they arise, that you proactively engage with them. And I think that's um, also relevant in terms of, of uh, legislation and regulation. So coming back to that particular point, do we need to uh, regulate, do we need to legislate AI? Um, so as Albena has pointed out, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening on the European level at the moment. Um, at, right now, there is uh, out for consultation and uh, inception impact assessment on regulation by the European Commission, um, which indicates that there will be something happening uh, in the first quarter of next year. 
Uh, but at this point, it's not entirely clear what that something is, which is why your question is really pertinent and relevant right now, uh, because these decisions are being made uh, in the Commission. Um, so very briefly, I think uh, the attempt to regulate uh, or legislate AI in general uh, is probably not a particularly good idea, not least because it's very difficult to define. Um, we've already heard that AI is now pervasive. It's in you know, yeah, my, my telephone. It has uh, AI in it. Uh, every Google search is based on AI. If we wanted to regulate AI, we would regulate everything. Um, and that's probably not what we want. So the question then is, how can uh, the question of regulation be dealt with? How can we make sure that um, where perceptions of inadequacy of, of uh, individual commitments, uh, for example, by the tech industry, uh, exists, how can we move beyond that? How can societies ensure that um, good outcomes uh, of AI are being achieved? And I think, the, as you indicated, we already have a lot of reg uh, regulation and, and legislation. We have a lot of regulators, and it probably makes more sense to develop a, a sort of ecosystem and infrastructure of um, interlinking and collaborat collaborating entity uh, entities that work in this space. I mean, the Commission and many others use this, this uh, metaphor of an ecosystem. Right, so it's the ecosystem of excellence, the ecosystem of trust, and I think the, the metaphor for the ecosystem is really useful to think about how we could deal with the regulation. So what are the main points in the ecosystem that can be addressed in order to, to spread good practice, in order to ensure that um, the, the various members of the ecosystem can work together in order to achieve an intended outcome? Um, and th those will then uh, now touch on things like uh, body of knowledge, sharing good practices, public engagement. Um, so, so I think the sort of the systems view is really necessary, and I, I suspect that that's where the regulation will go. So the idea is not to regulate every single piece of AI that happens in every company, uh, but to develop this this overarching approach that will allow uh, the, the various stakeholders to come together and work together in a shared direction. Yeah. Thank you. That I think that makes perfect sense, and and I think in in that what we also see is an increasing body of work in in what is also termed value based design, right? So that you make these choices when you start building things. Rudy, um, I, I think you 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 have a point where you say, um, you know, AI is actually also a lot about design choices. Um, right. can, can you maybe expand a little bit on what you mean by that? Well, if we want to use ethically responsible AI systems in the future, we need more than just guidelines, assessments, and regulations. We also need tools that allow us to actually integrate such principles into the design, which means we have to move, I guess, at least from evaluating to integrating. So I think that's what ethics by design should be all about. So despite the fact that more and more people share this view, they rarely go beyond stating that we need to integrate values into AI applications, which leaves the question as to how that is supposed to happen in practice. So. Personally, I believe that if you want to develop actual ethical AI, uh, we need to look at the different ways an AI, an AI system can learn what is and isn't ethically responsible. So the question should be, how can we build systems that are able to act in an ethically responsible way in different situations? So there are... Uh, I, I love your question. And if I would actually just love to take that question and ask Francesca Rossi that, right? So um, not only do you work in AI, uh, you also work for a big company, IBM. Uh, and I think they just came out with something which says, um, how do you uh, um, build uh, ethical, responsible AI? And I must admit, I'm a little bit in two minds about this because on one hand, we've seen large companies backtrack on AI things like face recognition. Uh, and, and Google has done similar things, and now they even come out with AI as a service, uh, sorry, ethics as a service, uh, where they're trying to help customers navigate this yet another thing which you have to worry about when you're already dealing with complex technology. So could you tell us a little bit more about the design thinking at, at IBM on how to design ethical AI? Of course, I mean, like, well, everybody said here that definitely the principles are not enough, the guidelines are not enough. So IBM published the principles, so-called principles of trust and transparency in 2016, but then immediately we understood that we needed to spell out in a much more actionable way these principles. So we said, what does it mean? So these are the principles of trust. So we said, what does it mean to trust a decision or recommendation from an AI system? And we spelled out through four people 
pillars. One is fairness, transparency, robustness, and explainability. Uh, explainability for us is very important. Uh, I, I'm saying that not because the other ones are not important, but because in some other domain, in some other business model, maybe explainability is not as prioritized. But for us, that we give AI solutions to other companies, and so to work with their professionals, explainability in that human-machine teaming is especially important. And then we said, OK, now we want our developers uh, to build, um, uh, to, to, to deliver, to build and uh, design, uh, develop and deliver AI that has these properties. But uh, so how do we help these developers? We can, of course, enforce something and be there passively as, a, you know, we build, as I said, the internal AI ethics board, say passively, but also we wanted to be proactive and help these, co these uh, divisions of the company that develop AI and say, OK, we build toolkits, we build educational activities, the developers need to be aware of the possible biases, for example, that they can inject. So into in, indeed, I'm, I would like to, the practical things a company could do. So one is education, right? Yeah, um, education. The other you one know, is, what's uh, in education? Um, also, community-wide discussion is important. People have yeah. to feel that they're not receiving guidelines from the top down. They need, feel that they are co-creating a way to build AI with mm -hmm. the right properties. And, yeah. uh, and also, uh, it's it's not that simple because, for example, IBM is a very large company. There are many different ways to build solutions for our clients. Some developers use a certain platform, others use another yeah. platform. So how do you help them? It's not that you know straightforward. So you need to be uh, really understand well what are the challenges from them. You need to understand what are the challenges in injecting, for example, bias detection and mitigation algorithms into their uh, design and development process. And then, since IBM also has the research labs, then how do you connect what comes out of the research labs, which is innovative around bias, explainability, to possibly the, 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 the work that developers are doing. And another thing is how do you evaluate once uh, the product is almost uh, finished in their thinking and there is a possible potential offering that the business units wants to propose to a client. So how do you evaluate whether this is something that you actually want to put forward or not? So the AI ethics part, for example, had to think about, okay, do we only care about the properties of the technology, so fairness, explainability, yeah. or do we care about something else? And we said, no, we also care about the uses of that technology, not just the property. Okay. So you actually ask a lot of questions, and I would like to actually take those questions to Emma, okay. right? How do you, uh, uh, and this goes a little bit also uh, maybe back to Rudy, where, where I was a little bit short in, in the idea of what you just said, Francesca, is co-creation, right? Uh, uh, and co-creation. There's been a lot of I would say probably the most nefarious use, at least in the US, of, of, of AI is face recognition technology, which almost every large company stopped selling to uh, law enforcement in the US, which is very specific US centric. Um, Emma, could you talk a little bit about uh, co-creation in a different way where you where you try to, with Bernd Stahl, as idea is you try to be before the, the problem, if you will, where law enforcement is there actually to build trust or I don't know, make us safe, right? Um, I, th I think you you may have some practical experience with that or not. Uh, I do have um, a very interesting experience with the Dutch police. Um, they commissioned us to make a study with an extremely interesting approach. They asked us to investigate how the young generation sees the role in the police in 10 years. So they basically asked the public the question, how would you like to be policed? And it's extremely interesting because this kind of question is the basis for having a user-centered design of the police services. But it's also interesting maybe to design the new laws and regulation we'll need because uh, for people, it's probably easier to identify to the concrete harm and then how the police should address them than more abstract laws or, or regulations. Um, so we could do a bottom-up um, uh, approach to, to design them. And then it also implies uh, how to police the police, because they were very aware that people might fear that these things we observe in other countries could happen in the Netherlands. So how would you surveil the surveillance? And 
also who should be allowed to use those surveillance tools because now they're available to other people and the police. So should citizens want to have surveillance tools for themselves, give them to security companies, what should be the limits they would put on, on those security protocols or the surveillance tech in general? So they ask themselves, how would you want us to police the harms that come from those technologies? And we just scratched the surface of this question, but at least I want to share this approach. I think it's very interesting. So I, I think going back to Rudy and, and, and taking your example is that this is very much a, almost a bottom-up co-creation thing, right? I mean, they, they might be inspired by a lot of principles, but at the end you are working with people who are working uh, on, on something. How, how do you see that going forward, Rudy? Because I, I, I think you were onto something when, when I moved away a little bit. Um, Maybe a little bit. <laughs> well, I think one thing we haven't really discussed is that we also have to look at uh, different system approaches. So how can AI learn what is and isn't ethical? So we can do this bottom up or, uh, or, or, or top down, but in the end, AI has to make ethical decisions also by itself. Um, so it has to learn what is and isn't ethical. And our, I think there are three different system approaches. Uh, the first is, can you program ethical rules into the system? Uh, do we have to equip the system with ethical goal functions? Or is the system itself able to make more judgments? And no matter what approach we will select, it's virtually impossible to map in advance what the possible implications of the different design choices are, because the optimization of AI systems is a process of trial and error, I guess. Uh, and this means that new challenges emerge during the development process. So you can't just think upfront like, okay, it needs to um, be this and that. It's a, it's a system, it's a, oh, sorry, it's a process. And in the process, we need to make sure that ethical issues emerge during the process, not only upfront, not only uh, afterwards, it's really into the process itself. Okay, to use a horrible word which has been overused a lot, it's a journey uh, um, um, where, where, where everybody has to learn. I mean, what I always find interesting is that AI is a technology that forces existing organizations to look at each other, how they can add value in a new way. Um, I think we're almost out of time. I mean, I, I could go on forever and I think you all as well. Uh, because you have so much interesting to say, and I'm sorry that I could not give you more time or a bigger podium um, uh, to say more. Can I quickly uh, um, whiz by all of you uh, to do a, a little bit of a Dr. Phil final thoughts on uh, things you would like to um, uh, give the audience? We have two minutes, so you have 30 seconds to kind of sign out, if you will. Um, let me start by, uh, well, there we go. Uh, Emma, let's do it alphabetically. Your, your final thoughts on, on, on ethics and AI. Uh, my final thought is that everybody should be, should feel entitled to have a say in, uh, in what are the harms they see or they envision for themselves and also uh, be entitled to ask for explanation, for explainability and transparency and to be explained what is the uncertainty matrix, what kind of uncertainty can occur. And, and it's our role as uh, experts also to to accompany them, to, to, to let them gain the expertise they need so that they have a say in the process. Agency to the people. All right, I like that. Uh, let's go to the um, uh, next one alphabetically, which I believe was Rudy. Right. As we talked about today, we need like ethicists, philosophers, developers, biological people, sociological people, but uh, we shouldn't forget about the designers. I think that's an important group uh, in this uh, multi-stakeholder approach. All right, it's designing very complex um, um, systems, essentially. Um, Francesca, I think you're, you're next if my alphabet still <laughs> works. Okay, so I think that, yes, all this is, uh, you know, everybody said multi-stakeholder, collaborative, uh, you know, multidisciplinary and so on, to make sure that AI has the right property so that we design and we develop AI with the right uh, behavior. Um, and, but I think that by doing that, the, uh, the, the goal should also be also to use AI to help ourselves. Uh, be more aware of our values, be more aware of our biases uh, uh, and improve ourselves. Because I think that 
the, I mean, at least for me, the ultimate goal is not to improve AI. The ultimate goal is to improve people, society through the technology. And right. uh, and and so yes, AI can be very beneficial in many things, but it can also be beneficial if we are yes. doing right. I love that final thought. AI as a mirror, it shows us who we are. And the final thoughts to Bernd, very quickly. Uh, so my highlight would be the importance of expectation management. Um, ethics has been with humanity forever. Ethical issues uh, have been discussed since we've become humans. They will not go away. I think we should be very clear that we will not solve the ethics of AI. Uh, it's a worthwhile topic to discuss, but it will stay. We will not solve it. All right. So that's a, it's good to still have uh, Greek philosophers in high school uh, be taught. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but some things are universal. Thank you very much for this high-level expert planning and, and our introductory speakers. Um, from uh, all of us here uh, at Elsevier and from the AI community, I would like to say thank you. Thank you to all our panelists and speakers for what I hope was an interesting cross-section of the diversity of, of the AI community. I encourage everyone to join. It's, much, it's not a technocratic discussion. It's a discussion that everybody needs to partake in. Thank you very much, and um, we will see you next time somewhere. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.